welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the Madden America podcast. And this week we talk about electroconvulsive therapy or electroshock as it's known in the US. On Wednesday, September 19th, this emotive and controversial intervention was discussed at the 57th Maudsley debate held at King's College London. The motion proposed was, this house believes that ECT has no place in modern medicine. Supporting the motion were Professor John Reed, who has undertaken several scientific reviews of the literature supporting the use of ECT, and Dr. Sue Cunliffe, who was a paediatrician who has lived experience of ECT. Both John and Sue took time out to talk about the debate and the wider issues surrounding ECT use. First, we hear from Professor Reed. John, welcome. Thank you so much for finding the time to talk to us again for the Mad at America podcast. So, on Wednesday, September the 19th, the 57th Morsley debate was held at King's College London, and yourself and Dr. Sue Cunliffe spoke for the motion, which was, this house believes that ECT has no place in modern medicine, with Professor Declan McLaughlin and Dr. Samir Juhar speaking against. So, John, to begin, can you describe the debate for us? Yeah, first of all, I just want to say it's a wonderful thing the Institute does to hold these public debates. This is the 57th they've done, um, and that they invite people like myself and knowing, knowing the sort of thing I'm going to say. So it's a very honourable and uh, informative thing that they do. Interestingly, the very first um, Morsley debate back in 2001, the first of the 57th, was also on ECT. Um and this was the first time that they've re revisited uh, a, a topic. In fact, Lucy Johnston, uh, who many listeners will know of, a, a clinical psychologist here in the UK, um, proposed the motion back then, and she she emailed me a couple of days before the debate to say, "I can't, I can't believe we're still debating this," which was kind of interesting. Yeah. Anyway, um, it was a it was an interesting evening. There was uh, about three hundred or three hundred fifty people. There it was sold out. I know lots of people were turned away, um, and um, my contribution was to primarily to summarise the research, which in a nutshell says there's never been a study um, showing that ECT is any better than placebo beyond the end of treatment. There's been ten studies um, comparing ECT and placebo during treatment. Five of those found no difference and five found a very temporary improvement for about a third of people. And on the basis of this, all, all the other reviews, apart from our own, um, pronounced that that's sufficient to pronounce ECT as uh, effective. Um, and then there's the research, of course, about um, the brain damage and memory loss. And I summarised that. And we really don't, the sad thing is we don't know how many people because the research is so small and and poor but the estimates range from um one in eight to just over half of people with permanent or long-lasting memory loss and then there's the fact that there's no study showing it, it prevents suicide which is another of the mantras that are wielded out um no evidence to support the theory that it's the depression that causes the memory loss not the ect all well, the studies show it actually is the the ECT, et cetera, et cetera. I tried to take the, the tack that this is all about the power of belief, really, um, because when it was introduced in 1938, people were genuinely excited. Um, people who, who had been trying to help people in hospital, who had been stuck in hospital for 20, 30 years with no effective treatments whatsoever because they, they hadn't figured out yet that these were not medical problems. But uh, So they had been trying all sorts of different chemicals, none of which worked at all so when they came up with this idea that um well they noticed that people with epilepsy don't have schizophrenia and and so they thought the cure for schizophrenia might be to cause epilepsy that was the genuinely held belief and um they really thought it was gonna help people and it it probably did because of the power of that of that belief that was conveyed to to these people and some got did get a bit better um, but the history is largely about early discharges 
um, by the doctors who gave the ECT and then convincing themselves that they were better. So, but there weren't any studies for the first 13 years. But by then it was established it works. And I have to say it actually does work for some people. But the sad thing is it's um, all the expectations and hope and attention um, that is causing the lift in mood, not unsurprisingly, not electricity and grand mal seizures. Um, how they actually thought electricity was going to deal with the sorts of things that make people depressed in the first place, I don't know. But I did, I did a little bit more history around the fact that early on the autopsies were so bad that, in, in terms of what was going on in the brain, that they developed a theory in the 1940s that it works because it causes brain damage, um, because it wipes out um, un unpleasant memories, which is a wonderful and horrible paradox because back there they did have a sort of trauma theory of mental health problems um, but they thought the idea that the solution was to wipe them out anyway so we, we, i did all that um and then sue cunliffe seconded the motion uh, sue is a quite wonderful person she was a pediatrician until she had ect and was no longer able to practice because the effects on her brain um was so extreme but she she gave a very uh, impassioned plea really um on behalf of as she put it of the thousands of other people who have been through the same sort of thing as herself and her main point yes she told her story but her main point was that worse by far than the actual brain damage and memory loss was the denial by the psychiatrists who did it and by psychiatry in general that these sorts of effects are real she finds that extremely distressing um, as I know do many other people. So that was our case. And then the other side, I had um, Dr. Samir Johar, who seemed like a, a, a lovely man, very careful not to not to offend any of the people in the audience who had ECT, but unfortunately didn't really understand science or scientific method at all and put up slides that um, are about studies without realising that most of the studies he'd put up weren't actually statistically significant, but he didn't seem to understand or, or or care about that but he was a very nice sensitive person i thought um and then we had it got a bit weird towards the end we had um declan mclaughlin who is possibly the uk's lead ect researcher these days produced I think, 100 or 200 papers none on whether ect works or not he just starts most of his papers with the statement ect is very effective without giving any references and then he goes on to look at differences between types of ECT, unilateral, bilateral, et cetera, et cetera. And his talk was quite, um, well, it was, I'll just give you two, two quotes from it. And people will be able to see it and judge for themselves, I hope, when the, the um, video is up. Um, he, he said ECT is the most effective treatment in medicine, which had some of us giggling a little bit because that is just such a bizarre statement. Didn't feel the need to back that up at all with any studies he just stated it and then to and this was actually not funny although a, a lot of people did burst out laughing but actually it's insulting to people who who have been affected by ACT he said the amount of energy in a electroshock therapy is less than the amount of energy in a banana now that is funny but it's all, as I say it's um when you've been through it and know what it's like um, and uh, have struggled with memory loss afterwards. That sort of minimising is um, pretty irresponsible, I think. Um, but then we got a bit of a glimpse as to at least a partial, possible partial reason for why he would make such bizarre, extreme statements about efficacy and such minimising statements about the safety issues, um, was that, uh, I didn't notice it, but a member of the audience noticed that one of his slides had reference to uh, Mecta, which is a, a, a manufacturer of ECT uh, machine. So it seemed like he was being sponsored or some of his work was sponsored by uh, Mecta. So we have a parallel here to, you know, the sort of conflict of interest with drug companies. And John, did Professor McLaughlin declare that or was it just a note on one of his slides? It was just, a, it was on a small print of one of his slides. So no, he didn't uh, declare it, um, nor did the, uh, yeah, in, in his introduction or, or as he was introduced, he, the information he gave to the institute to introduce him with did not include that. Um, I've been on his webpage. I can't find anything about it on his CV. So, 
Conflict of interests are very important. So I have publicly emailed him and will put the res- I've told him I'll put the results of that on social media um, and people can judge for themselves. These things really ought to be declared fully. I mean, even if people notice MECTA, no one would know what MECTA is. You have to, you have a responsibility to, to actually spell out conflicts of interest, I think. But anyway, um, it might be, that might partially help us understand why he makes such silly statements. Um, I mean, you can, I mean, the accurate statement about efficacy is yes, it can help some people temporarily, largely placebo, um, and make your case around around that. But to come out with it is the most effective treatment in medicine is, um, I don't know, words fail me. Um, after I had just stood up and said, please, will the speakers behind following me, please identify a single study showing that it's more effective than placebo mm-hmm. uh, at the end of treatment. And they had the opportunity to do that. Didn't bother. Well, they can't really because there aren't any. So I suppose it was unfair of me. But... Um, so still after that just announced that it's effective is and then but that is what i that i guess that was my major point really this is all about belief and and they're, they're genuinely held beliefs um but if psychiatry wants to be in you know play a part in modern medicine in evidence-based medicine they have to drop this sort of um well it's not really a treatment i don't know if we can call it that um it's basically what it is just to be blunt is 150 volts through brain cells equipped to deal with a fraction of one volt. That's what it is. And the goal is to cause seizures. So you've got one branch of medicine trying to cure seizures and this branch of medicine trying to cause them. So they really need to um, drop it as as eventually they drop lobotomies. And, and that was another point I made. I reminded the audience that we have been here before so many times with people genuinely believing that what looks in hindsight as something bizarre, like rotating chairs, surprise bars, standing people next to cannon fire. You know, in hindsight, it's we laugh. But uh, at the time, there were people who would stand up and sure and defend them and say, "We know it works. We can't remove this from our uh, from our repertoire." Um, but and so the power of belief is um, is very powerful. Well, I should imagine that for Dr. Cunliffe to hear someone say this is the most effective treatment in medicine just further minimizes her experience, doesn't it? It does. And and she was pretty unhappy about that sort of silly statements. And as were several members of the audience who spoke up about their, their experiences as, as well. We did get the standard question from the audience um, I've forgotten his name now, very senior psychiatrist, was chair of the psychopharmacology committee uh, until recently, um, asked the question, well, we know that depression is, severe depression is very toxic and and um, involves uh, memory loss, so um, why are we still saying it's the ECT? So the cause is the memory loss. It's the same old, same old, it's almost victim blaming, really, Um although that might be a bit extreme, it's certainly locating the problem as they always do within the individual, Mm. even when it's what they have done to that person that's caused it. And even when the evidence is quite clear on that point, they just, I had just finished describing the evidence when he asked that question. (laughs) It's like, I guess it just, some, some things just won't go in. I mean, I think what it comes down to is if you, if you're going to do something as extreme as, you know, put that much electricity through someone's brain you've got to believe very strongly that it works and you've got to believe that it's safe and those beliefs must be rock solid um and, and unshakable by reality but the, but but the good news is that it's um the use is dwindling fast it's well not so fast it's slowed down uh, we're on a bit of a plateau it's down from 50,000 in the 1970s 50,000 a year to two and a half thousand now and the last ECTAS, the uh, accreditation service report that came out, that says it's still falling. So it shouldn't be too long before we'll be able to add it to that list of ridiculous things that we used to do in the past. But in the meantime, it's not even been monitored properly. The ECTAS, um, the, the accreditation service, is has been the contract has been handed to the Royal College of Psychiatry. So talk about the um, <laughs> the fox watching the chicken coop. It's just um, the, uh, the, Stu was telling me she's looked at it very carefully, uh, uh, more carefully than I have. 
she says a, a criteria in the criteria A issues involves having a toilet and cleanliness. Um, criteria B is monitoring for cognitive deficits after the EPT. <laughs> so, so we're not monitoring. And the audit we did last year of all the NHS trust shows that there's very little monitoring of whether it works, um, you know, whether it's helping people, or certainly very little in terms of whether it's um, causing the cognitive deficits and memory loss, which is in breach of NICE guidelines, because NICE guidelines say you must monitor for memory loss and memory dysfunction so that you can stop it immediately at the first sign thereof. But um, it seems that most trusts are not not doing that. So what was the outcome of the debate, John? I came away feeling very positive. Most uh, we, we won the debate in terms of the official the official way they evaluate these debates. It's kind of interesting. They take a vote beforehand and a vote afterwards, and the winner is the one that shifts the most people in their direction. So at the beginning, we were about 40 or 50 votes behind. At the end, we were one vote behind. So um, we shifted a lot of the people who were abstaining at the beginning and and a few of the people who were on the other side of the motion. So um, I think it was informative. I think it was great that the Institute puts these sorts of things on and then puts them out by video. The, they were going to uh, live stream it, but um, technical problems got in the way of that. Um, but anyway, it should be up very soon and people will, with all the other debates, which are many of them very interesting, um, similarly controversial topics, they don't shy away from the controversies of the day at all. Um, so there's a wealth of information on, on that website and I hope people get something out of watching this latest one. Well, John, I just wanted to say how well I thought you and Sue did to shift so many to supporting the motion. And it just goes to show, I think, that the evidence and the facts were on your side. Yeah. It's a shame we couldn't get uh, everybody to be evidence-based, but the world isn't like that. And we, and we all, as, it, as I said, we all have our strongly held beliefs. So one of the interesting issues about ECT is who it's given to, because the best predictor is not to what symptoms you have. Um, or what your diagnosis is. Um, there's, there's three things that predict it. One is the antidepressants didn't work. Um, but more interestingly, in a way, are demo- two demographic variables. Women are given this treatment twice as often as men everywhere in the world since it's been measured for so for 50 years or more. And the average age of an ECT recipient is in just about every country is between 60 and 65. So the archetypal person getting electricity through their through their brains is an older woman and we could make some guesses without generalizing too much about what what older women who are unhappy and sad and distressed and depressed might have in common and what they might need and my guesses would be it's closer to losses and loneliness and poverty and those sorts of things not not everybody of course um and these are the sorts of things that sort of get buried behind this purely biological approach um and i don't think you can fix loneliness and loss with electricity um so there's never been a really good explanation for why it is that old people um, and women uh, get targeted with ect the best i get is you know john don't you understand that this is a group of people who are more depressed than other people and then i will say yeah but why And then there's either blank silence or um, some nonsense about hormones in terms of women or I don't know. In other words, it hasn't really ever been properly answered. But um, it just shows that what we're dealing with is uh, 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 is a social phenomenon, not a biological or medical phenomenon. And um, I'm just I'm just struck by the first time I ever was involved in ECT was when I was a nursing attendant in the 70s in, in New York. And. And uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, five o'clock, the, the line of chairs in the corridor was filled up, six or seven people waiting for ECT. They were all older women, almost always, and I couldn't understand what that was about. And I, I had the job of sitting with them after they came round, which is where I learned my early lessons about ECT, apart from the pounding headache when they regained consciousness. Um, the... 10, 15 minutes sitting with them while they tried to figure out who they were and where they were and why they were there. And then that, and, and my job was to help them gradually do that. Um, but the last question was hardest when I, when they would ask, well, why would they do that to me? That made, why would they do something to me that makes me so confused and with such a pounding headache? And I, 
I wasn't able to answer that question. Um, but I, I will relate one more, just one more story that's just come to me, James. Um, uh, 1980s, first job as a clinical psychologist uh, up in Chesterfield. And uh, somebody died within two hours of having ECT. And in the ward round the next day, I tried to raise the fact that in the notes it had said ECT contraindicated um, serious heart condition. I was very young and naive. I, I didn't I had no idea what would happen next. I was asked to stop saying such ridiculous things, and I and I refused to stop saying them. I was then, as a clinical psychologist, I was physically removed from the room. <laughs> I was. I, I didn't understand. I had no idea of the power of, of denial of these things. Um, I had the good sense to go copy the page in the notes where it said ECT contraindicated and where it then said died um, two hours after ECT. And I made a copy of them. And sure enough, when I went back the next day, that page of the notes had disappeared. And I tried for two years to lodge a complaint with the hospital, with the hospital management, um, with the Royal College, and just absolutely nobody would would reply. Uh, I was just astonished. The power of denial is, is as I say, is uh, astonishing. Um, but we are we're getting there, and I think in about ten years' time it will be gone, like like lobotomies. It won't go by making it illegal. I don't think uh, it'll just fade away as fewer and fewer psychiatrists um, use it. We already have a twelvefold difference between the most. Uh, the trust that uses it the most and the trust that uses it the least. So we can see that more and more psychiatrists are just um, not doing it. Mm. And that's how it will fade away. And I think we're very nearly there. So I want to thank John for chatting with me today for the podcast. And before we move on to chat with Dr. Sue Cunliffe, just to say that there's a link to watch the whole debate, which is available on the post that accompanies this podcast on maddenamerica.com. And next we talk with Dr. Sue Cunliffe, who stood for the motion alongside John Reed. And Dr. Cunliffe was a paediatrician until she herself underwent ECT, after which she describes becoming cognitively impaired and found herself unable to continue working. She now campaigns for the risks of ECT to be made more explicit and to directly address the professional denial of the damage that ECT can cause. Dr. Cunliffe, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. And I'd like to ask for your reflections on the debate at King's College. But before we do, I know that you worked in medicine yourself as a paediatrician, but then came to experience ECT. So I wondered if you could perhaps tell us how you came to have ECT and what your experience of it was. Yeah, that's fine. Basically, I suffered a reactive depression. I'm not going to go into the cause of that. um, But my depression, you know, had a cause um, from stemming from things that were going on in my life. And instead of being offered psychology, I was just given antidepressants. And you are never going to get better um, from depression if you don't actually look at why your depression is has started, what's caused your depression. Um, so I just drifted further and further down into depression I was labeled as being drug resistant and I am not frightened or embarrassed to admit that that I did become suicidal and I was admitted into hospital um and I was offered electroconvulsive therapy and being a doctor and a patient um and This was in 2004, 2005, so the internet wasn't as available as it is now. My family are doctors, and we agreed that ECT, which was sold to me as a very safe treatment, that I would have no long-term side effects. Um, We decided that it it was going to be the best thing to get get me better, so we consented to it. So... um, I started on my electroconvulsive therapy and if you look at my notes right from the beginning of the treatment starting, in fact, I find it hard to use the word treatment, but from the first shock, you see in my nursing notes that I'm beginning to question my memory and I'm asking the nurses if this is normal and I'm expressing concern and it's about my third or fourth um, shock. I say to the nurses, and the nurses document this, that I am really concerned 
that this doesn't feel like my depression. It doesn't feel like my drugs because nothing else has changed. And could this possibly be the ECT, you know, causing me, causing my brain damage? Um, and I said that I didn't want any more treatment until I'd been able to speak to my consultant about this. Now, there is absolutely no documentation in my notes that the consultant ever came to see me. In fact, quite the opposite. And the ECT just continued. There was in my notes uh, an ECT treatment sheet, and it clearly states that no ECT should be given unless the box has been filled in, and that box had to be filled in each time, and it said that you had to assess a patient's cognitive functioning and none of those boxes are filled in and there's no comments from the doctors about my cognitive functioning and there was definitely no testing going on. So I just end up having 12 doses of electroconvulsive therapy with complaints about memory going on. And to demonstrate how bad my memory was, um, the nurses have documented in my notes quite clearly that the patient cannot remember what it was that caused her depression. And that is quite a big memory loss to have. So I then continue being exposed to the cause of my depression and just remain on tablets. And even though there's six months between the two courses, although NICE had said the, that's the National Institute of Clinical Excellence their guidelines in 2003 said that, you know, all patients should be offered psychology. There was plenty of opportunity to try and engage me in psychology, but that never happened. And I was told I was, you know, my, my consultant later on said I was too ill to have psychology. Um, so I then find myself having electroconvulsive therapy again. But what I distinctly remember is that the way I was feeling I, I can I can I can remember it now and I actually now recognize that actually I wasn't experiencing depression. I was experiencing the symptoms of brain damage, which can mimic depression. Um, but if you know what you're looking for, you can distinguish between the two. So I then start on my second course of electroconvulsive therapy. And again, in my notes, you see my memory and my ability to just function is decreasing, but that's because I'm being given concussion twice a week. And one of the things that ECT does is it affects your emotions. It robs you of your emotions. So you start seeing the comments in the, in the, in the notes that, you know, I have a really flat effect and, you know, she's anhedonistic. I think that's the right word, just no joy. And I'm sort of a shell of a patient. But instead of them thinking, could this be electroconvulsive therapy? Is this brain damage? They actually think that the ECT isn't working and they turn the doses up. And then I start actually getting physical symptoms. So my hands start shaking and my speech is slurred. And if you actually think about it, when you pass an electric current through the brain, it doesn't select what part of your brain it's going to affect. And so I am postulating that the more electricity you pass through somebody's brain, the deeper it's going to penetrate and the more areas of the brain it's going to affect. So it started affecting my speech area and my coordination. And it's, it's quite distressing reading your notes when you're there as a patient and you are telling people over and over again that you can't recognize people's faces and you can see it as a, even as a lay person could look at my notes really and see, you know, that, that this was brain damage occurring. Um, and yet it was just ignored. And I see each time they gave me a shock that they stole a bit more of my life from me. Um, and they did pause it on the one last but one, because they did wonder if it was the electroconvulsive therapy causing me to shake and have um, slurred speech. But they then just carried on with it at the same high dose and gave me, you know, really big final shock. And I'd gone from being a depressed doctor. I was a paediatrician. I was, um, you know, it sounds very arrogant, but I was very intelligent. I was very able I was sort of able to look after and ventilate um, premature babies going down to 25 weeks. I did child protection cases, looked after very serious kids on the ward overnight. I was the senior doctor. And by the time I got off the wards, I was left such that um, my my hand shook, my balance had gone. I 
would just fall over anywhere, whether that be in the house, whether that be in the public. I'd lost the ability to get myself through a door. And I used to walk into door frames. But the worst thing about that, and it sounds ridiculous now, but I have this memory of walking into a door frame for the umpteenth time and then saying to myself, should I be able to walk through a door, you know, a, a door frame without walking into it? And my memory was so bad that I didn't know whether I should or shouldn't be able to get through the door, which now is just sounds absolutely ridiculous. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't read. I couldn't do simple maths. So I couldn't even use money in a shop. And I realized that the only way to deal with this was through, well, almost, well, I, I just used to laugh, you know, it was, it was self-deprecating humor. And I used to literally tip my money out onto the surface in a shop or hand my purse to a shop assistant and say, can you take the money out, please? Um, and then in terms of, you know, recognizing people's faces, I just couldn't and I couldn't put names to faces and, you know, navigating. Uh, I just couldn't remember the simplest of routes. And it didn't matter how many times I would I did that route I, uh, or had done it in the past or how many times I did it after my ECT. I struggled for a long time just to navigate around the roads um, locally. And I think, um, as I said, emotions do get affected and it was one of my friends reminded me of this. But if I was with somebody, um, I could feel happiness and I could feel love. But when that moment was passed, I was no longer able to remember those emotions. I couldn't feel those emotions. Um, and so I remember going on holiday with my kids and saying to myself, right, you've had a really nice day today. You won't remember how this feels, but you have to remember that you had a nice day. And that's a really difficult thing to teach yourself. But if you can't teach yourself to remember that you had a nice day, if you can't remember those emotions, you know, it, you, you you then just people will then think you're depressed. So you have to tell yourself, I'm not depressed. This is just how my brain sort of denies me the ability to recreate emotions and to feel happiness once the moment's passed. Um, and I think it's it's not just the physical symptoms. I think you you live with the fear and and humiliation and you know there's so many more emotions involved I'm sure I have gone through grief but I sort of have decided that there's no point in feeling angry about it because I don't want it to ruin the life that I have created for myself thank you Sue and I'm so sorry to hear about everything that you went through can I ask when you discussed these issues with your psychiatrist or treatment team what was their response for two years after I had my ECT I could not get the psychiatrist to say that this was caused by electroconvulsive therapy and they told me it was as I said they told me it was drugs they told me it was my mental health I got into this awful position where I was classed as manipulative, controlling. I was labelled as personality disorder. And I know that no other v ECT victims who've had exactly the same. And you get stuck in the cycle and then you're not listened to. Um, and you find yourself, not surprisingly, getting quite cross and frustrated. And then, of course, you're, you're seen as being mentally unstable. And I, I clearly remember um, having a meeting. My parents were in the house. The community team had come in there. And I tried to say to this guy that I don't think I'm depressed because I wake up in the morning and I feel OK in that I, you know, I look forward to getting up and I get myself dressed because it's nice to make myself look nice. And I was trying to demonstrate to him that I start off functioning OK and I didn't know it at the time, but what would then happen is that my brain would tire so rapidly that you're then not able to think or to do anything and you lose your emotions. And that's what they were taking as depression. And he turned around to me and said, oh, you've just got low self-esteem. And I just remember getting so cross and I actually ran out of the room, jumped in a car and drove off. Not because I'm mentally unstable, but because you're trying to tell me I'm mentally unstable. Um, and I managed to portion, portion, perhaps I was lucky because I'd had my medical background that I wasn't willing to accept that this was drugs or depression. And I actually was seen by the same team, the same mental health team, I was seen by their neuropsychologist. And I remember going to see him 
And I just remember dreading it. I remember thinking, I'm just going to come away from here feeling so humiliated, like I always did. And I got into this room and I just described my symptoms. And he just looked at me and he said, what you're describing is brain damage from electroconvulsive therapy. And he said, I can't be 100% sure about that. I need to spend a little bit of time with you um, so that I can just make a proper assessment. But that's what I think is wrong with you. And that was the diagnosis that he came down with. Um, And then I spent three years with him um, working out how to live with my traumatic brain injury. But within six months of starting with him, he recognised that, you know, the traumas that I'd suffered uh, that had caused my reactive depression that they needed dealing with. He realised that I'd had a horrible experience of being severely depressed of the trauma of having electroconvulsive therapy and then the two years of absolute denial that it had happened. And then I needed to come to terms with the person that I now was, not the person, you know, not the doctor. So it's, you know, it was, he taught me how to to live again and how to accept who I was and taught me how to redefine myself and be happy with, with, with who I am. And, um, You know, three years later, he recognised that when he discharged me, if I went to my GP and described my brain injury symptoms with the history of mental health problems I'd had, he knew that the GPs would refer me straight back to the psychiatrist. So um, he was great. He took half a morning off work and made an appointment to go and see my GP. He spoke to my GP before I got there. And then I sat there and spoke to my GP and she just said, you know, I've learned such a lot because, you know, I knew nothing about the symptoms of executive functioning and processing speeds that, you know, people with, you know, cognitive brain damage um, suffer. So that was great because he ensured after all his hard work that I didn't get fed back into a psychiatric world where nobody was going to listen or accept it. And I would have ended up back on drugs and re-diagnosed with horrible diagnosis. So and and he gave me the, the, you know, he gave me the tools so that I could overcome my depression. And he's taught me how to deal with very difficult issues that can go on, on in people's lives. And I have been exposed to some very difficult things over the last few years since that happened I've had a um, an ill child who's been out of school that I have had to battle for four years to get an education for I've been and you know I'm going to say this because this is a horrendous experience but you know I was I had a, a section 47 child protection case taken out against me for fabricating um, a child's illness and I was found not guilty but I'm just trying to evidence that despite everything that's gone on having this chronic illness you know, that I am actually a very resilient individual. And, you know, I've, I've learned how to not become depressed, how not to need tablets. Um, and I think it shows that, you know, if you learn certain skills about how to deal with situations, then, you know, it's, it's a good way of preventing people becoming depressed. Um, and I just keep going and I keep just battling on, um, you know, because, um, you know, because I, I feel that I am a lucky ECT victim because I have had that neuro rehabilitation, even though I've not had an acknowledgement from psychiatrists, I've had it diagnosed by a neuropsychologist. And so, you know, I have credibility um, and I have an acknowledgement of brain injury. And I know that what I experience is true and real and that I've been allowed to accept that it's been extremely traumatizing. Um, and and I'm proud of what I've achieved in my life since, you know, I was given that support. And I just wish that all the other brain injury victims that I know had had the same opportunities to achieve and move on in their lives. Absolutely. And Sue, you mentioned when you were speaking in the debate about psychiatry's denial of the damage caused to you and others. And you mentioned that this denial was almost worse than the treatment itself. So I wondered if you'd reflected on why psychiatry is in so much denial about the effects of ECT. I think it's probably one of the easiest medical scandals to hide in that you're dealing with probably the most vulnerable group of patients in society. We're very easy to dismiss 
they're very easy to paint a picture of as as being mentally unstable and so we have that 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 first issue is yeah there's it's very hard to get that diagnosis i don't know how the psychiatrist can continue to deny it i know there's a lot of research that has been done and i think one of the issues with the research is that neither side is ever is is in agreement as to whose research is right or wrong and in 2003 and in other years the national institute of clinical excellence identified that there was not good conclusive evidence to say that ECT was safe and effective and people may disagree with me but i think the only way to move forwards with this is to say okay let's get the opponents and the proponents of ECT let us plan some good quality research that will be meaningful at the end and that both sides can agree that they will honor and respect the results of that trial it's been 80 years and people are still banging their heads and they can't agree and to me that's one thing i think needs to happen but in all their denial what i find really hard and it, as you know from the debate um if you go on to the royal college of psychiatrists ect accreditation service website there's a lot of information on there and in their 2014 patient survey so we're talking 4 years ago they identified that 63% of the patients that answered the questionnaire suffered some form of memory loss but really what is really worrying and this is probably an underestimate is that one in five almost one in five they, they about 18% so about one in five patients suffered what they class as severe permanent memory loss and i think this brings up another issue and and again it came up in the debate is that psychiatrists don't understand what brain damage actually means you don't have to have tests to diagnose it you don't have to have you know so you don't need a brain scan to diagnose it you don't need to do cognitive functioning tests the actual definition of brain damage is a is a change in a person's ability to function so you know it's indisputable for me i was a doctor i can no longer work you know i i struggle even today to be able to drive um when and where i like and you know there are certain days that my brain tires so quickly that i actually can't perform the simplest of tasks like cooking or you know even holding a conversation there's some days i wouldn't actually be able to sit and have this conversation with you um so i think that's an issue so when they're saying that 18% of patients suffer severe permanent memory loss that actually means that they are suffering severe permanent brain damage now that is available on the royal college website but you saw that even though i brought that up at the debate that never came into the opponents debates and what i don't understand is how when they have that figure on their website they can actually look patients like myself in the face and even if we bring up all the evidence that there is they just sit there and they just say ah oh, yes but the data says well yeah your data does say it but you're choosing not to look at the data that you as a college produced and i think what's even worse about the fact that they produce this data and they you know don't talk about it is that when you read that survey there is no comment on the end about oh gosh mm 18% of patients are suffering severe permanent brain damage there's no concern there there is nothing saying right so we have to improve our standards so that we can at least reduce this down and what are we there was no there was nothing in there saying okay what are we going how are we going to identify these patients and what are we going to do for them because living with traumatic brain injury absolutely destroys lives and i think you know we need to just look at what's happened over the last um 6 months 6 or 7 months um in the uk and i think jeremy hunt in earlier on in this year basically stood up in parliament and said you know for too long we have ignored the evidence of patients 
And actually, we have to change the way that we the way that doctors operate, that it's we can't dismiss patients. We can't just look at evidence. We have to listen to what patients are saying to us. And one of the main reasons for that is because you don't want more and more patients to to be harmed by a treatment if it can be prevented. And what he did was he launched inquiries into different medical treatments. And I think that now that is happening, I think it's incumbent on the Royal College of Psychiatrists to soul search for themselves, that they need to follow the example. And I think that at sort of halfway through this year, we had a gold standard produced, and that was produced with regards to the vaginal mesh implants. Um, and what what has happened there has been a big admission that patients suffered. And I think we can draw parallels, very strong parallels between ECT and mesh implants. And I think if we can draw parallels between that, we should be asking for exactly the same things to happen within ECT and that the Royal College of Psychiatrists should take on board what's happened and they need to make the same changes. So these mesh implants, um, they caused a lot of problems with women. Um, They've caused pain, um, excessive pain. People have had to have them removed. It's wrecked their lives. And one person unfortunately died. And if you look at how the inquiry was held, they basically said that this is a good treatment. It helps people, but it has serious side effects. So let's, for argument's sake, let's say ECT does help people, but it has serious side effects. So then we look at what action has been taken. And I think that one of the biggest qualms is that, you know, NICE clearly stated and still state that all patients should be offered psychology before they are given ECT and they should have had good drug trials. And so the first thing we have to ask, is that really happening everywhere in the UK? Then we have to make sure that, so we're we're basically targeting the patients that we're giving electroconvulsive therapy to. And it's important that if you are going to administer a treatment that, you know, is really life-saving, that we are only offering it to patients as an absolute last resort. And I have to question whether or not that is actually happening within the UK. John Reid, he might have brought this up in his debate, but um, John did an audit last year and he identified that there were areas in the UK and Worcester, where I had my treatment, is one of their, those areas where they use ECT 12 times more than other areas. Now, that shouldn't be happening and the, if, perhaps if the Royal College acknowledged that ECT caused serious side effects, what they should be then doing is saying, well, all right, let's look at best practice. Let's look at those areas where they're using it least. What are they doing? What patients are they targeting? What treatments are they using to reduce that, that, you know, to reduce ECT down? Because if you reduce the number of patients down who are getting it, you're automatically reducing the risk. Then there was a very there was a big similarity between consent, and I was told that it was safe. And you know, you look at the Royal College ECT information leaflet, and they say that ECT is safe. Later on, they do go on and you know give quotes that one in ten, or and even up to perhaps one in fifty, when you look at patient surveys, are suffering brain damage. The way that they write it is very, um, it's almost. You know, it's almost saying, well, we we don't really believe the patient surveys, but they shouldn't use the word safe. You know, um, Scottish ECT accreditation service, their information leaflet says ECT is safe. And then they go on to warn about negative media um, created, you know, by by people like myself who are actually acting responsibly, saying, hang on a minute. I think there's a few things going on here that we should be looking at. Um, And of course, if you consented people correctly and I'd signed up to a treatment that said, actually, Sue, you might not be able to ever work again. Is that a risk that you want to take? Your child may end up having to care for you. Are you happy with that? you're going to be financially stuck. You're not going to be able to drive your car. You're not going to be able to count money out. Well, if I'd chosen to have that illness, then I could have no complaints. So 
what I'm really impressed with is that the Royal College of uh, Obstetricians and Gynaecologists have produced, I think it's about a 16 page information leaflet in which they clearly outline the risks and they also quantify the risks. So they'll say one in five. So, you know, that is a serious risk. So, you know, the Royal College needs to sit down and really improve its consent procedures. So we have no complaints. Um, and then what they've also said is that, um, you know, it's really important whenever you're giving a treatment uh, is that you 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 monitor for patients. And, and NICE have said that, you know, you need to monitor for cognitive functioning. But actually, I don't think NICE went far enough because if you look at my notes, each ECT caused a little bit more destruction every time it was cumulative and so actually what what each psychiatrist should be doing is if I was a psychiatrist I would want to know that my patient didn't have brain damage before I gave it and that I wasn't causing it so it would make sense now I'm going to let's just throw it out and let's say if you were giving a drug in which you knew that that drug was going to cause liver damage as a doctor, and I've worked on wards, you would be doing blood tests every day to make sure that what you were doing wasn't causing harm. And if you saw that what you were doing was causing more harm than good, we would stop that treatment. If I didn't monitor blood tests and allowed a person to go into, you know, awful liver failure to the point that they needed a new liver, I would have no defence. There'd be no defence for me not um, not having monitored for it. I would be responsible because I didn't act sensibly. But what shocks me about all of this is that um, the Royal College of Psychiatrists has an ECT accreditation service. And in their 2018 standards, you can get accredited if your unit is not monitoring for cognitive functions it's not an essential criteria now that to me is really dangerous but I think it's incumbent on each psychiatrist to actually be monitoring their patients and I would be very surprised if the hospitals are aware that you know they're giving a dangerous treatment but they are not required to monitor for it and I bet that the, 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 the you know that the hospitals uh, don't understand that you can be accredited without monitoring for the most serious damaging side effects that really I think any treatment can can cause. What the mesh implant have asked for is that they've said every time that we have an incident that has to be reported to hospitals and the national reporting system and that's set up so that they can collect accurate information about the number of times that an incident is happening, the, the, you know, the number of times and the severity that you're getting a side effect associated with a, you know, with a treatment. You heard how serious my brain injury was. If they couldn't diagnose, if they were incapable of recognising that I had brain injury, I know that, you know, my ECT brain damage didn't get reported. And that's dangerous because if they didn't report mine, you have to ask how many other hundreds, thousands of people have never had this brain injury reported. And because it's not reported, it's not logged and people can't see that there is a trend. So, you know, the Royal College of Psychiatrists need to be reporting every instant of brain damage. But that's impossible if you have a group of people who won't even who don't know how to diagnose brain injury and who can't see the most severe ones. So we've got severe failings, real, you know, really big failings in safety. So let's do what the mesh people have done and let's introduce proper monitoring. And then what they've also recognized is that the patients who have had this treatment in which they were told what the serious side effects could be who have had their lives destroyed they have set up centers throughout the uk to support victims of the mesh scandal and i believe now that also people will start getting compensation for it so you know people who've had traumatic brain injury need support we need diagnosis and we need 
then to get the neuro rehabilitation that I was offered so that these people can actually try and learn to begin to live their lives. You know, I haven't had a job, but because I had my diagnosis, it's been easier for me to, you know, to get um, to be able to get to get benefits and to get medical insurance and things. But there are people around if you don't get a diagnosis uh, and people don't realize what you're suffering, you know, that they can't get the the, the the emotional support, the physical support, the financial support. So, you know, I think that, you know, it's so easy for people like me to sit here and say, let's ban ECT. Um, but I look and I think, well, people have tried that for the last 80 years. So why not try a different way? Let's say, come on, let's sit down, let's work out what's best for the patients, because what's going on now is not best for the patients who've had ECT and have been brain damaged. But I don't think it's good for those patients who are considering having electroconvulsive therapy. Because, you know, if they go on the la- on the web, which they can nowadays, you know, they're hearing horror stories, they're hearing success stories, and they can't make head and a tail of it. Um, so, and I also think that the Royal College is com- constantly complaining and, and, and psychiatrists are constantly complaining and blaming people like myself for negative media images of ECT. And they're saying that we make it harder for patients to choose to have ECT. Whereas I beg to differ, you know, they always quote one flew over the cuckoo's nest. And you'll have seen that in the debate that um, Declan brought that up. And to me, that's insignificant. That's not frightening. What happened to me was frightening. And I actually believe that I'm not doing it because I want to frighten victims. I'm trying to raise public awareness. I'm trying to raise awareness with, you know, through my MP, but nobody wants to listen. But it's my, I see it as my public duty to say, hang on, look, the Royal College have got data and they're they're happy to admit that side effects are occurring, but they're not consenting people you know, and, and they're, they're, they're exposing patients to excessive risk. I agree. And Sue, since the debate, I noticed that you've been engaging recently on social media, particularly with doctors who defend its use. And that's been quite interesting to see. I've only just started Twitter in the last week. Um, and I was following a doctor yesterday, a young, it sounds like a very young doctor. Um, and I posed questions to him and, and, and questioned his beliefs and he has an absolute belief. I mean, he says the side effects are to- tolerable. And he actually stated in this Twitter that he, you know, he's trying to give a nice informed chat and, and explain he'd, he'd given ECT to nine patients that day and how brilliant it was. And he actually said there is no data that ECT causes brain damage. But you've got to stop looking at data. You have to look at the real and lived patient experiences And I am so concerned that there is such denial there and that it's those doctors who are producing the research. Because if you couldn't recognize my brain injury and you're producing research, a lot of the times they are not using the right tests for for brain damage um, and they they don't look after the first few days. Um, You know, we're relying on these doctors who are so blinkered that, they are going to produce evidence that says ECT is safe. So, yeah, it's it's been a fascinating experience this last week. You know, and, and I've challenged this guy on Twitter and he just doesn't respond to, you know, the, the questions that I've asked him. It's interesting, isn't it? What you see in those exchanges or what I observe anyway, and I've had similar kinds of exchanges about psychiatric drugs Although psychiatry often claims to be working based on data and evidence, when it comes to some of these treatments, they're operating from a perspective of belief, it seems. Yes. To me, if I am willing to say that a treatment has helped people, and I I said that in my speech, I stood there because I think that was an important statement to make, because I should not deny another patient's experience. But that doesn't go the other way. Medicine in the past has always had a tendency to cover up because hospitals don't want to be sued. You know, I had all the evidence that my hospital had totally and utterly ignored nearly every single NICE guideline that was out. And had they followed those guidelines, I would never have had ECT. 
or if I'd chosen to have it, it would have been better con- informed consent. So I couldn't have had a grudge. And out of the 21 times they gave it, they had 20 times to choose not to give it. But because they deny ECT brain damage, they don't know what they're looking for. Um, and it, it is, it's it's a complete denial. And I think that's what's worst. And I think that there comes a time, and I think there is a time now, there is a momentum for the government to say, look, hang on, we've got to draw a line under it. This is what Jeremy Hunt said, that, that patients are not only suffering the injuries that they've suffered, but they're suffering the denial and the apology and the and the acknowledgement. And at some point in time, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, just like the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, are going to have to put their hands up and say, we have, you know, been like many other doctors in the past, but we're going to change. And you'll, you'll see on Twitter um, that actually somebody managed to get Wendy um, Byrne, the, the president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, to um, agree to meet me. But I do want to take Wendy up on that. And I hope Wendy will take this opportunity to be seen as the Royal, as the president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, who had the courage to do what is right you know, I'm not telling her to ban ECT, but, you know, look, do some soul searching and follow the examples of the Royal College of Gynecologists and Obstetricians. Um, They have recognised that what they have done to patients with a treatment that was supposed to be safe is wrong. And they recognise that they have suffered terribly emotionally and that the denial is probably the worst aspect of it for, for most victims of medical illness. You know, I was either lied to and ECT was dangerous or ECT is safe, but their safety standards were so bad that I suffered brain damage and they have to face up to those questions. Um, And sadly, as you know, they don't and we're stuck in the same light, you know, in the same rut that we have been for 80 years. Well, Sue, I think that's the reason why the debate and your engaging with Wendy Byrne is so important because... You and John did a magnificent job at the debate and the swing in the audience vote just shows how powerful your arguments were. I sincerely hope that you get the chance to meet Wendy and can give her the perspective of a professional medic who has real experience of the damage that ECT can result in. Yes, it'd be interesting to see, you know, be interesting to see what happens, um, you know, when we, when I, when I do have that meeting, um, I, I hope that she does take me seriously, um, I'm not really going in there with any hope, but it would be great if she could see that there is wisdom in listening to patients. Yeah, I hope she is very genuine in her offer um, and only any time will tell if if we can move forwards. And as I said, I know that I may get a lot of criticism from people who say, let's ban ECT, but we've hit our head against that brick wall for 80 years. And as a doctor and just trying to be realistic, I think we're much more likely to be able to save patients by adopting, you know, a, a sort of a constructive way forwards than one that, you know, that the ECT doctors, you know, would never consider. And, and it would be very bad for me to, you know, could I really live with myself if I said ban ECT because I've had a bad experience? I'm not sure I could live with that, even though common sense tells me that that's what I should be asking for. Each year, the ECT accreditation service uh, produces data about the number of patients who've had ECT, the the gender, the age, um, the types of illnesses it's been given for. Um, and they then look at how successful ECT was. But what they never produce figures on is the number of side effects. And I think that's really worrying because it's not how, you know, it just, it, again, that just shows how much denial that they are in. And and I don't understand a pay, uh, that there must be in so much denial that they have no concern for their patients. And that's what worries me is, is the absolute denial in thought, word and deed, really. Well, thank you for speaking out, Sue, and addressing that denial head on. I think that's so important. As I said, I think that that debate was for and against and and I it, it was good that we won and I'm really glad that I had the opportunity to to speak about my um my experience and I hope that I did represent the voices of many thousands of people who who haven't been heard 
Um, and that was a great opportunity. And I just hope that I can use it as a springboard to try and bring the two sides together. And as I said, if nothing else, let's just try and improve safety. Let's try and get a dialogue and let's see where we can move move forwards from there. And let's make sure that mental health care patients get the same safety and consent that is now that, you know, that was offered to the mesh implant um, victims. Let's make sure that they get their diagnosis of brain damage. Let's make sure that they get their neuro rehabilitation because that's what they desperately need. Um, and I think that's probably one of the first things that I'm going to ask Wendy for is that these patients are identified and um, and they get the support that um, that they need to overcome their traumatic brain injury so they can start living their lives properly. So thank you to both John and Sue for chatting today. And as mentioned, you can view the entire debate on YouTube and a link is provided on maddenamerica.com or Madden in the UK too. So thanks for listening today. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates. 